Okay, um, welcome. Thank you all for coming to the launch of After Grenfell Violence Resistance and Response. And I will take off uh, my name tag. Um, so we're very happy to be launching uh, this book today, and I'm particularly happy to be joined by so many panelists today. Um, we've got a number of the contributors uh, from the book uh, up here today, and we've also got Andrea Sefnik uh, responding. So let me start by introducing uh, all the personnel, and then we're going to go into the book launch. So um, to my very right, we've got Dan Bully, who's a reader in international relations and the director of the Global Politics, Economy and Society Research Center at Oxford Brookes University. And he works on questions of international ethics and responsibility, especially in relation to migration space and cities. Um, well, wrong order. Um, <laughs> next, we have Nadine El Enani, who's a senior lecturer in law at Bergbeck School of Law and the co director of the Center for Research on Race and Law. And Nadine teaches and researches also in the fields of migration, refugee law, European Union law, protest, and criminal justice. I'm Maya Tsifus, and, and I'm a professor of international politics at Manchester, and I'm hosting the event. I have not had the privilege of being in this particular book, but to my left, I've got, uh, yeah, here now my preparation is falling apart. That's, I that's have got Nigel de Naruna, <laughs> who teaches at the University of Nottingham, and his research interests are in housing, race, and migration, with a focus on the way people have been excluded from access to adequate housing. Um, and then we've got Patricia Tuit, who's a legal academic and former professor and dean of the School of Law um, at Birkbeck, and she runs an online academic resource which provides free open access research commentary and resources to support the work of NGOs, campaign organizations, academics, publishers, and legal practitioners. Um, and then to the left of Nadine, we have Jenny Atkins, who teaches at the University of Manchester. She has written about missing people, trauma, and aid, and her latest book is about whether academic work helps or hinders in the struggle for change. And she's experimenting with fiction and life writing. And to Jenny's left, we have J Tony Walsh, who's also known as Longfellow. He's a performance poet from Manchester who grew up in social housing. He had an 18-year career managing council estates and working on inner city community reg uh, regeneration. And those of us who didn't know Tony before probably know Tony now since he performed his poem, This is the Place, at the vigil for the victims of the Manchester Arena bombing in May 2017. And finally, we will have Andrea Sevnik, who's a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Manchester. And she works on race, subjectivity, and legal questions, and all things interesting. So what we're going to do is that we are going to have some of the contributors talk about their contributions, and then Andrea will respond. We will then have a reading of Tony Walsh's poem, Equity. Then there will be space uh, for people to ask questions and for us to engage in discussion. And finally, we will have another reading of uh, a poem by Tony Walsh before um, we have a reception outside. So without further ado, I give you Dan, Dan Bully. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just introduce where the book came from and some of the contributors we've got in it. We're happy to have in it. So the book really kind of started uh, from a tweet Jenny sent in um, around July 2017. And I just got on Twitter, so I didn't really know how it worked. But um, Jenny's tweet was quite simple. It said something like, is anyone in inter international relations talking or writing about Grenfell? If not, does this show a problem with international relations? And um, I was quite receptive to Jenny's critique of um, international relations, uh, but the comment really got me thinking about the kind of global impact or, and, and the global uh, contributing factors to Grenfell. But it became, as I tried to set up a panel at an international relations conference, it became apparent that international relations wasn't interested in Grenfell, it genuinely wasn't. And that, that was obvious at the conference that we uh, ended up presenting it. 
So when we got the chance to edit a book with Pluto um, and Nadine um, agreed to come on board, um, we realized we were going to have to um, look further afield and see what, who was responding to Grenfell. And it became apparent lots of people were responding to Grenfell, but it wasn't. The most interesting contributions weren't necessarily academics. So um, <clears throat> between the three of us, we uh, approached a range of people that we had um, kind of through internet searches and the like that we had found their contributions useful and the response was was incredible so um, people like um, uh, Tony uh, came on board very generously and very quickly um, Loki offered uh, to uh, let us use the lyrics to his song Ghosts of Grenfell and um, the academics we found most interesting were those that were treating Grenfell understanding Grenfell as an event that was no accident right it was not necessarily intentional, but it was something that was predictable and that was the product of decades of violence um, and decades of decisions that were deeply political but didn't have to be made. And um, as we got more and more people on board, um, the process of editing, while very quick, we brought this book together very quickly, um, thanks to our contributors and their work, um, it was a very uncomfortable process. Um, it became apparent, I mean, from my own perspective, I'm a middle class white guy from, who grew up in the northeast of England with no experience of problematic housing tenure. And it was really obvious I was not the guy to be contributing or editing this book. And I think we all felt uh, really uncomfortable with this. And this is something we try and um, kind of live in the introduction to the volume. Um, and even now, we're not, uh, not comfortable with what we've done. But I think we're pleased we did it um, on balance. Um, and we think that the contrib contributions from such a range of artistic, um, activist, and academic voices has led to a, a really important um, contribution to the debate. Um, so I'm not going to talk any more about my own, um, my own piece, but you're welcome to read it. Um, instead, I'll hand over to Nadine. Um, yeah, so thanks, Dan. It's a shame you're not going to talk about your piece because your piece is really great. And, you know, I think um, when, you know, I didn't know personally either Dan or Jenny before getting on board with his project. And so the Dan sent me his sort of draft piece and I read it and I just knew that this was somebody that I wanted to work with because the piece was straight away acknowledging that Grenfell, yeah, exactly, was no accident, that it... Um, that lying at the heart of Grenfell are the uh, condi conditions of violence which preceded, you know, what caused the immediate causes of the fire, and which um, and and which he tracked internationally, globally, um, financially, politically. For, you know, it's it's an amazing piece I think, which really synthesizes, you know, how such violence can occur and seem so local, but is actually really global and of course that then raises the question of well who's responsible what's responsible and how can we begin to think about response before um, um, without sort of understanding these these this kind of intricate um, web of causes of structural causes and so and that's really um, uh, that really resonated with how I felt um, also um, about the fire and how to respond to it and so my own um, I think the reason Dan contacted me was that shortly after the fire, I wrote um, a blog piece um, called The Colonial Logic of Grenfell because, and what spurred me on to write that piece was um, shortly after the fire, an academic call for papers was um, circulated that didn't sort of seem to acknowledge Grenfell as not only being, um, not only having um, structural violence at its core and not just the immediate violence of the fire but it didn't take into account race um, and histories of, of um, uh, racial um, oppression in Britain and I felt that this was really a, a narrative or an angle that could easily be missed but that it was important to bring in alongside um, class and um, um, austerity and other sort of structures um, that, that also clearly um, it impacted in relation to the cause of the fire. And so I, I wrote a short piece 
And it was particularly at that time because I, was, I had been invited to speak at an event called Feminist Emergencies, which, and it was really the, the, week, the, the week of the fire. And I just felt like I couldn't go into that conference and talk about any emergency other than what, you know, what we'd seen with the fire the, the night before or two nights before. Um, and so I structured my talk around um, Grenfell um, and kind of trying to think about Grenfell in terms of not, not, you know, kind of asking the question of where is the epicenter of the fire? Is it, is it with the immediate causes or, is, or, or where, can we, where can we say the fire began? And so what I tried to do was to look at um, how Britain's imperial history and in particular how Britain has responded to its subjects arriving in Britain or its former subjects now often called migrants and various other terms, um, how Britain has responded to them and what has led to them living or being particularly and disproportionately vulnerable to living in housing um, and precarious housing conditions. Um, and one thing that I really wanted to make clear in my contribution was that whilst um, the terminology around the fire was um, often a tragedy, um, you know, something terrible that should never have happened, what people didn't really want to ask is, you know, but why did it happen and why did it happen to these particular people and could it actually have happened to anyone? And I, th and I think one thing that I wanted to bring out is that it was very clear to the people it did happen to that it, was, that it could happen to them and that it was going to happen to them. Um, as we know, Grenfell residents were really active in trying to make their home safer for themselves before the fire and nobody listened to them. And not just nobody listened to them, but as um, was reported by those who, can't, who have spoken to Grenfell residents, they were treated as though they were guests and that they should be grateful for what they do have. And they were treated as undeserving of, the, of basic things that their um, more wealthy middle class and, and, and upper class um, neighbors could, could take for granted. And so I was really interested in why this is the case. You know, what is it about Britain's former colonial subjects um, or people who are racialized as, as non-white in particular or people who are classed in a particular way are thought of as undeserving of, of basic um, um, human needs that, that other people might have. And so that's the kind of way in which I try to, to look at what happened um, with the fire in terms of its causes and also in trying to think about response. What I argue, which is what I argue in a lot of my work on immigration, is that we need to take very seriously how Britain's imperial history um, continues to shape um, the contemporary. Um, and so, so that's, how, that's how I try to understand um, Grenfell. And, and, and that's, I think, a, a theme that runs through a few of the chapters, like Gracie May Bradley definitely touches on that, and Sarah Keenan as well, um, kind of really trying to bring um, a, a historical, or look at Grenfell also through a historical lens to try to understand how that kind of violence um, could occur today and to the particular people who it did, who it did affect. Um, so yeah, that, that's what my contribution looks at. And, and yeah, I just want to stress that it's the contributions that make this book. It's the, the fact that we have photographers, um, artists, um, poets, um, as well as academics and people who've worked in policy, practice, human rights organizations, all kind of thinking from their particular positions about Grenfell and thinking together. And yeah, so I really encourage you to, to, read, to read the book. Thank you. Thank you. Nigel. <coughs> okay, well, my contribution was about housing and the kind of history of housing as exclusion. So um, focusing really now on race and um, migration status as mechanisms of exclusion, but going back in time, where social class and wealth were elements of exclusion. I've just recently been researching some other work and was reading a short article in The Hospital, which is a journal of The Lancet, um, where they talk in 1903 of the need to make housing for the working class and the problem was the aliens. And this is a precursor for the Aliens Act and we see this kind of rhetoric of shifting blame in very much around us today. We've seen it in the election that's just taken place. We see it in the kind of common sense rhetoric. And we see it in the lack of response from the government to the events of Grenfell. So the promise of an inquiry into social housing, into looking at the needs of people in this community, assumes an exclusion of those who are seen as not having a right. 
Now, I want to kind of diverge because I think there's a... My piece feels quite dry in reading the emotion in many of the other contributions. Um, and I want, just want to diverge onto what this institution is about and how it sits in its neighbourhoods. Um, so if we look on both sides, there are all spaces of social housing that are being squeezed by the action of landlords in attracting the customers of this institution. And I think there's a real kind of issue for Manchester and for universities generally in the way that they displace working class populations from the centres of the cities that they operate in. Um, it's a real challenge and um, universities don't seem to take it very seriously. So I do know this one because I studied in this building. Um, and here there is a corporate uh, commitment to corporate social responsibility which recognises 10 wards across the city as ones where we need to intervene in. But if you walk into those wards, you will see housing being built for the people who live and work here, for the people who study here. And you will see displacement going on so that people on the estates over towards Brunswick can't afford to rent houses. Families can't afford to rent houses because students will take a two-bedroom house and pay for three bedrooms £900 a week. A family house in Manchester should be around, is, the affordable level is around £600 a week. So people are being displaced and those people who are being displaced are the children of people who live in the existing social housing. Combined with the right to buy, we have a kind of a real challenge for housing people who need it. We exclude one section of people but we still don't have enough to, to meet the needs of our populations. And that is a legacy we're leaving to future generations, which is a toxic legacy. Um, I don't think Grenfell was uh, an accident. I think it was something that we could see happening. And I think nothing has changed that we can look forward and see those kind of events and the stigmatization that goes on of people who live in social housing continuing onwards and there is, seems to be no political kind of answer to those those processes of exclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patricia. Thank you. I've, I've got a few um, handwritten notes and I'm, I'm realising I'm find it, going to find it hard to decipher them but let's try. So just uh, ten days ago the chair of the public inquiry into the Grenfell Tower fire announced that the final report and recommendations relating to what is just phase one of the inquiry terms of reference, will not be delivered until October this year, and that's at the very earliest. So it will take uh, two and a half years for the bereaved and survivors to get the very minimum that justice demands, which is an official account of how the fire started, how it spread, and, and much more importantly, an official account of the nature of the emergency, uh, uh, the responses of the emergency services and other relevant organisations. Now, one of the aspects of the inquiry process which will account for a significant portion of what is now a very much prolonged first stage is what is known as the Rule 13 procedure. And this is a, it's a statutory provision which prohibits inquiries from publishing a report which contains criticisms of individuals or organisations without first warning those individuals or organisations of the nature of the criticisms that are to be levelled at them and giving them a chance to respond. And it's estimated that that process, this Rule 13 process, will take about four to six months. So I, I draw attention to this um, because it provides an example essentially of the theme of my chapter. The justice that the inquiry was supposed to provide for the bereaved and uh, the survivors turns out to be nothing more than the law that exists in the legislation and in the courts. And, and as the Rule 13 process shows, this is a law that will always prioritise the interests of state bodies and of uh, powerful private economic actors over and above uh, the survivors and the bereaved of an atrocity <coughs> such as Grenfell. In essence, what the Rule 
13 uh, process will do is to ensure that the officials who ignored the concerns of the Grenfell community uh, over the safety of the building will receive this official account um, of the Grenfell Tower fire before the survivors. And um, in the, the other contributors to the volume make, make a similar point. For example, in um, Monique Charles's essay, which is chapter 10, she states, and I quote, those accountable for any crime to date have been individuals and residents in the community. Those who are governed by the state, <coughs> nobody from the state or any organization in the role of having responsibility for the safety of the residents at Grenfell Tower have been charged, and many are still in post. So the um, post-crisis or the post-atrocity public inquiry is now a well-established feature of the governance structures of, of several countries, not, not just the United Kingdom. But it is a form uh, that is entirely wedded to a legal form. It's a, a process that's entirely wedded to a legal form. And that legal form has proved in, in various contexts, not just in the uh, Grenfell context, but it has uh, proved to be in tension, shall we say, with the pursuit of justice. And essentially what my chapter does is to attempt to outline various ways in which legal norms and processes are deployed to obstruct any attempt to hold the state to account for the deaths, the injuries, and of course the displacement from homes caused by its systematic failure to manage its resources so as to provide safe and affordable housing on a non-discriminatory basis. Uh, and essentially that, that point can't be made uh, at, in, in the inquiry. And, and of course the, that, that point is elaborated um, much more so than I do in other, about social housing in other chapters, uh, most comprehensively of course in, in Nigel's uh, chapters. Um, but just to conclude my short intervention today, what I, what I want to do uh, and have attempted to do, although uh, in retrospect not as well as I would have liked in my chapter, is to highlight the ways in which the bereaved and the survivors of Grenfell, although struggling with unimaginable losses, have consistently sought to force the state to listen uh, to what Loki refers to as the ghost of Grenfell still calling for justice. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's a, this, I think, to the community uh, role and activism is a theme in the collection. Uh, there's a chapter by the Radical Housing Network which uh, attests to the fact that it is, in, in, in their words, groups firmly based in the local area who play the most part in seeking justice and reparations for those affected by the fire. Uh, others talk about um, community, uh, uh, communities and individuals who are affected by the fire becoming of necessity um, campaigners. Um, having now read the whole collection, I realise how very partial is my account of these challenges. Basically, I focus on the formal legal challenge to the state's imposition of its somewhat degraded uh, idea of justice, and that's the judicial review case that was brought against uh, the, the Theresa May and uh, the chair of the inquiry, basically alleging that it was unlawful to set up an inquiry, that it was not overseen by a panel that was diverse in terms of races and faith. Um, that the challenge ultimately lost in the High Court must not detract from the fact that the case represents an important attempt by a non-state court participant, by someone who had lost a family member in the fire, to unsettle the norm by which inquiries are overseen by a single person, and usually, of course, that single person is a judge. I'm also following the uh, inquiry into undercover policing, which was set up after it was um, revealed that undercover officers had infiltrated the Stephen Lawrence uh, campaign for justice. 
And, it, and there, in the undercover police, and as well as Grenfell, it's not lawyers um, who are trying to change and unsettle the legal form. It's not the uh, state act representatives, but it is, uh, by and large, the non-state core participants. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to read an extract from, well, a slightly cut-down version of my piece for the volume. It's called The Interloper. From the platform at Latimer Road, I can see it clearly, more clearly than at any other point during my visit. I try not to look, to appear as though I'm not a stranger, a visitor, a tourist. Definitely not a voyeur, though that's what I feel like. A train comes and goes. I sit waiting, head lowered. But it's there, solid, in front of me. Eyeless windows charred black. Screams long since silent, flames extinguished. On the way down just a few hours earlier, but much longer ago, I'd been sitting on the tube with my back to that view. I'd not been intending to go, at least not yet. I didn't want to. It was both too personal and nothing to do with me. Residents resented people taking photographs as if on some sightseeing trip, and rightly so. The media had descended before it was even over, seeking out the worst stories and disappearing to write them up, speaking to camera in tones perfected in distant tragedies. But it wasn't a tragedy. It was an impossibility, a horror, an atrocity. In the lounge at the Crescent Hotel late the previous night, Will had insisted. You should go, he'd said. It'll make use of your journey here. I'd had to travel down to London unexpectedly, but I knew he meant more than that. We'd spoken about Grenfell. He sensed my reluctance. OK, I'll see how I feel in the morning. I made a bargain with myself. If I was up early enough, and if I could work out how to get there, and if I felt up to it, I would go. I was meet, meeting Rachel at Paddington to catch the 12.30 to Temple Mead, so it was only a minor detour. Around nine in the morning, I find myself boarding the Hammersmith and City line to Latimer Road. I know I'm on the wrong side, facing north rather than south as the train travels west, but the carriage is full and there are no seats opposite. It empties as we pass Edgware Road and then Paddington and emerge into the light, but I'm rooted to my seat. After Westbourne Park, the line turns south, and as we draw out of Ladbrook Grove, I catch a glimpse from the window. Down the steps, card on reader, out of the exit, I turn left. I don't have a smartphone and I've not brought a map with me, but I studied one beforehand. I know if I head south, the tower will be, up, will be on my left. Feigning familiarity, I set off. Ordinary suburban streets, haunted only in my imagination. Passers-by, mothers with pushchairs squeezing past me between bus stop and wall. Were they there that night? What did they see? A smartly dressed woman, heels clicking briskly, walks alongside a tall man in a suit out of place like me. So when's the exhibition on until, he asks. Well, it's going to be extended, comes the reply. Something to do with what happened, surely. And further along, railings carrying small remnants of ribbons, posters, mementos, notices saying where to go for help. I need to turn left at some point. I'm getting further away. Past a small triangle where a road joins on the right. Cafes, shops. I could stop, sit, pause, but I don't. I carry on. Finally, I turn left at random down a long street, the white fences of flats on one side, red brick on the other. At the end, I go left again past smart Victorian terraces with tiny front gardens. I'm basically lost, but I carry on to a T-junction and turn left again. It's increasingly hard to give the impression I know what I'm doing, the network of small streets is impenetrable, and I don't recognise anything. I make out a spire in the distance and head for that. Shortly after it happened, there were gatherings of people outside the nearest church, and tributes piled up against the railings. 
When I get there, I recognize it from the media coverage. I cross the road past the church and take another random turning. I can feel I'm closing in now. Suddenly, I'm looking at a phone box I recognize, the one that was covered in missing person posters. Scraps remain, corners sellotaped to the glass. For weeks, I thought I would remember my visit clearly. Now, writing this, I pause to search for pictures of the phone box to remind me what it looked like. I realize that what I've just written can't be right. The street name in the photographs is Bleckenden Street, but on the map, that street is on the other side of the tube station. I must have passed it on the way back, not the way out. My memory is hazy at best then, distorted even. Checking Google, I plot my route. I must have gone south along Bramley and St Anne's, left into Stoney Place, left again down Sirda, and then down Grenfell Road to where it's blocked off, past the leisure centre, then somehow, but I can't work out how, through to Notting Hill Methodist Church on Lancaster Road. I resume my writing. I continue past the church and eventually find myself outside the Maxilla Social Club, relieved but exhausted, not just from carrying a heavy backpack, but from taking it all in. This is as far as I will go, but this is also a hub. I know it well, though I don't know it at all. People were interviewed here. People gathered to support each other, to provide food, to talk. The club stayed open all through that dreadful night. Odds and ends of inhabitation are abandoned now. Chairs and plastic covered tables, candles, boxes, piano, incongruous under the concrete arches of the Westway flyover. The People's Public Inquest, first-hand accounts, facts, trans testimonies, and then strong capitals painted on the wall behind. In a zigzag formation, A4 sheets carry statements or messages of support. I read through them one by one. They're heartbreaking. I weep. Fumbling in my bag for a piece of paper, I copy some down. Politics is the difference between life and death, signed Anthony Anaxagaru. Another, horror must be when your eyes show something you cannot process, is just signed RIP. I sit for a time. Then I go through the arches and turn towards the tube station again. In this direction, there are large banners demanding justice, posters fastened to trees, and of course, the phone box. I stand in front of it for a while. From here, the tower is visible. Many of the photos of the missing posters took pains to include it. I turn away, walk on to the tube station. I check the departure board for the next service and sit down to wait for the train back, averting my eyes from the tower. There's a cold wind and the punched metal seats are freezing. Passengers are requested not to take photographs from this station, comes an announcement. I don't have a camera with me anyway. I am not a tourist. On one of the hoardings in New York after 9-11, someone called Mariette had written, We all lost you all and mourned together. We are not sightseers. I visited that site six months afterwards. Like here, it was difficult to navigate to reconcile the images I'd seen with what was there, but I never felt like an intruder. Looking back as I waited for Rachel in the cafe on Paddington Station, I felt as though the images in my head had gained a landscape to inhabit. If I wrote about what had happened, my writing would be more grounded. I'm not so sure now. I put a tentative hand on the backdrop, nothing more. I've seen the tower with my own eyes, seen a grey ribbon of fabric hanging from a high window flapping in the wind. But the landscape cannot speak. Maybe it lies. Or maybe things are just more complicated. Maybe it was not a visit anyway, but a pilgrimage. I wish I'd taken flowers, a card, a candle, anything, an offering to leave behind. Thank you. Oh, yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. Sorry. Um, thank you. That's quite a 
follow up of this really powerful reading, Jenny. Um, so I was just asked really to offer a couple of I suppose, comments, responses to um, not what you really heard, but all that I suppose as well, and um, the book, uh, which I think is, you know, I, it is delightful in, in as much as it is, you know, I suppose a, a really a testimony to a particular pain and a particular atrocity that, um, that happened. Um, what I'm going to do is really just do a kind of a short intervention, um, offer a couple of um, questions, I suppose. Um, and all, um, and they're all in a way inspired by um, the key messages, I suppose, that the, that one can distill from the preface, and then the, the this is a conclusion, concluding the concluding word, the afterwards. And the preface uh, is written by by Phil Scranton. Uh, so it was one of the key things that he says there, at least to me, when I was reading it. Like the message was really, um, well. Um, if um, um, it really one becomes a voyeur, if you know what, if 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 um, what 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 makes one a voyeur is that if one goes and looks at things and does nothing about it, so is this kind of a, the need to really act uh, in the face of uh, or as a response uh, to a particular atrocity or tragedy um, taking place? Then the other the other message from Robbie Shilley maybe afterward was when he kind of takes on um, in a way defense but also attacks I suppose the critical theory when he says that actually you know in the aftermath of particular of partic particularly horrible horror events uh, one sh one should be looking for answers one should be looking for you know to ideas as to how to solve how to solve problems that doesn't mean that critical theory has no place. But that you know we should be thinking as to what our engagements uh, uh, are, what are the outcomes of our of our reflections and of our of, of our acts. So keeping those two things, those two must be supposed in mind. Then I decided to just um, structure my my responses to uh, in, in accordance to the let's say the subtitle of the book, which is violence, resistance, and response. Because um, those three ideas really resemble and speak to all the, to all the the, kind of the essays um, um, that that we see um, that we see in this in this in, in this edition. Um, and specifically, if I just you know say something about violence, and I think both Nadine and Patricia and also Nigel spoke to that uh, really well already. But in, the wo in this volume, we hear a lot about the structural, the state violence, and kind of the hostile environment, really, that led to Grenfell. Um, that is, Grenfell was not an unexpected it, 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 it event. It really fits very well with the discourses of colonialism, of racism, of austerity. Uh, and, and, in, kind of, and also be this, I suppose, in the context of justice, of housing, of policing, as we can see in a lot of, in a lot of the papers, in a lot of the essays and, and poems um, as well. So um, what kind of really then comes to my mind is, is that the question of the how, how does the book, or I suppose broadly, how do we uh, make sure that you know, those injustices and violences are challenged or can be, can be changed? What could... Uh, or, or what what is or what could be our responsibility or the uh, that is the responsibility of academia or, or public intellectuals in doing that or in exposing those injustices and that is not you know kind of a staying within the in, kind of a, within in, within the kind of the bubbles of our disciplines but rather actually projecting this in the public domain what can or what should we be we, we be doing what is our responsibility in, in that the second point then is resistance. Um, and again, you know, these essays, some of them are just, you know, they, they are beautiful in the way they describe and talk about moments of resistance in this book. What forms uh, the, the, the resistance, the resistance um, took place, you know, either that as acts of solidarity or as actual movements, grassroots movements, community organizations, or community organizing. Um, some of the some of those actions or uh, or groups were kind of a, are distinct to Grenfell, but others kind of tie into much broader debates or kind of a, um, uh, yeah, struggles, uh, bro uh, glo global struggles against racism, injustices, state violence, and particular also austerity. And I did wonder, you know, is there a particular uh, form of organization, particular practice of resistance, or, or a response that is particular 
to Branfeld. Um, has Branfeld changed, uh, perhaps as a community, the way we think about community, the way we think about our responsibility to a particular community, or the way the community comes comes together and, and acts? Has this then translated into, let's say, everyday politics, party politics? And if it hasn't, you know, who's Who's to blame ultimately? Is it that we aren't doing enough um, to see that to see that particular uh, particular um, engagement translated into into the everyday into the everyday politics? Often there is also, I suppose, an idea that I'm not. This is not saying that this comes in, in the book at all, but that is that is often uh, that there is often linked to um, to resistance, and that is the notion of resilience. And I wonder, is this at all a helpful way of thinking about? Um, um, resisting or persisting in a particular situation, especially when it comes to atrocities such as Grenfell. And then finally, um, response. So a lot of papers, again, or as I speak about grief, anger, um, desperation, but also love, compassion, and, and hope, uh, it's become individual, community, and state response. Um, and I wonder, you know, if this book is to be considered as one of the responses, I'm not saying it is, but I'm inviting this kind of a, um, in one of the responses, uh, and considering the editors, uh, is, is this an academic response or a response of the academia? What kind of a response is it? So does it aim to do, to intervene into this kind of ideas of responding to, um, to the aftermath of the Thank you, Andrea. Um, so next, uh, Tony will perform his poem, Equity, which is also in the volume. Before he does that, I just want to warn you that I will give you a minute afterwards to collect your thoughts, breaking with the academic tradition of wanting to say something immediately as somebody to uh, finish, finishes talking. So Tony. Okay, I'll, I'll, thank you. I'll stand here for me. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here today, and, and I... Uh, Thank you for including me and um, I congratulate everybody involved in putting this important uh, piece of work together. And it's a privilege for me to be among such great thinkers and, and great artists as Ben Ockery and uh, Lolke, whose creative contributions are in the book. If you haven't seen Lolke's uh, piece and the Ghosts of Grenfell referred to earlier, then do find it on YouTube. It's an, ama an amazing piece of work. And my contribution to the book is a poem called Equity, which was commissioned by ITN, Channel 4 News, for their social housing special uh, just a few weeks after uh, the Grenfell atrocity in the summer of uh, 2017. They invited me to write this knowing that I brought two uh, lived experiences to the piece. The first was, was growing up in poverty in social housing myself. A few miles from here uh, where my, the inner city starts to meet the mill towns of Ashton and Staley Bridge and Stockport over there. My father was uh, an immigrant here from Ireland. He grew up with not much schooling in Ireland to illiterate parents in a house with no gas, no electric, no water, no toilet, no heating when he came over, into the hostile environment of uh, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Um, they lived with my nan, where I was born, in a rented terrace house, and moved to the classic slum that were cleared uh, wholesale uh, in Manchester just uh, around that time. So uh, they moved age 21 to a house with, you know, it sounds like a cliche now, uh, cockroaches, rats, damp, outside toilet. And I, um, I, I contracted rheumatic fever when I was three. I nearly died. I was very lucky to walk away from that and I took penicillin till I was 14. And when I had my heart checked a few years ago, the Indian doctor took his glasses off and looked over his nose and said, rheumatic fever, that's, uh, that's a disease associated with poverty, uh, as indeed it uh, is. Um, the other experience I, I bring, uh, not unrelated to that background, was that I then worked in social housing. By my mid-twenties, I was a housing officer just a mile from here in uh, Miles Patton and Ancoats, then the most deprived ward in the country under the index of multiple deprivation whilst living in Harper Hay, which was the second most deprived. Um, so I managed multi-storey blocks. I was responsible for fire safety inspections. I managed caretakers. I saw the uh, tendering process for fire safety and, and I brought that to the, uh, to the, to the piece as well. Um, the poem is called Equity. It's, uh, it starts with the dictionary definition of two meanings of that term. The first being the quality of being fair and impartial the second being the value of a mortgage property after deduction of charges against it. It talks about my background, it ends with a reference to Grenfell, and towards the end it thinks about the, uh, the policy context in which Grenfell happened, 
where we see under the guise of austerity, we see what is in fact going on, which is the ideologically led rolling back of 200 years of working people's progress. And in any, if this book was to be launched in any city, other than perhaps London, uh, next to the tower, of course, then this radical city of Manchester, the first industrial city in the world, the first to respond to these challenges of, of migration uh, in, in that modern context and to respond to them with social housing and uh, sanitation, uh, public health and so on, uh, it seems fitting to me. So here we go, equity. They say the swing in 60s, but for most, they never swung. The reality was poverty. Our parents married young and they moved their newborn baby to a rented terraced home where it wasn't the lack of heating that would chill us to the bone. They were the Beatles of a different kind, a classic, classic slum. Kathy come home, pregnant, crying, teenage wasteland. Mum. If they catch cold in the black mould, then the child's in trouble soon. And this child lay there dying as a man walked on the moon, age three, Rheumatic fever in a damp home but alive with my baby sister crying. I was fighting to survive. I was saved by penicillin, our amazing NHS, and a change in my life chances. From a change in our address, a council home, a tenancy, an indoor loo as well, three bedrooms and two gardens. And as far as we could tell, it was a home for life, respectable, presentable and clean. It was civilised and dignified. My mum kept it pristine. Well, as best she could, with four of us. She'd make do and she'd mend, and the neighbours did you favours, and we kids played out as friends. Is that too much to ask for in the Britain of today? Why is homelessness and hopelessness and heartlessness okay? Who decided that providing social housing can't be done, that we won't look after others, we'll look after number one? And where's this big society? Is it shrinking like the state? Is it not collectivism that has made this country great? If we will build a new Jerusalem in this green and pleasant land, well then who's the we we speak of? Do we fail to understand that we need happy, healthy workers if our nation is to thrive, but most are barely managing and many can't survive with no safety net beneath them or no roof above their heads or their children now lay hungry with black mould above their beds? 400 yards from here. Today, in a modern wealthy country, this is inner world obste obscene, still in poverty in Britain now, in 2017, as was. And it has, has to start with housing, social housing, from the Latin, socialis meaning allied. There are other words with that in, socialist and socialism. But of course, that is the target, to wrap up our post-war progress and to log it to the market. Always stocks and shares, not housing stock, not sharing, but demeaning. Does it take this council kid to point out equities, two meanings? While they're cutting, 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 cut. But now with people adding family members to remember in the embers of their cladding. Let this be the day we see the way to honour all their names. Inequality and poverty, austerity. Thank you.